An expert committee says that the benefits of receiving the mRNA COVID-19 vaccine continue to outweigh its risks. A group of doctors had called for vaccinations for young people to be stopped here. For a closer look, we're joined now by Dr. Benjamin Ong. He's chair of the expert committee on COVID-19 vaccination. Good evening, Dr. Ong. This is the second time that a group of local doctors have voiced concerns over COVID-19 vaccinations. And that's despite repeated assurances that the benefits outweigh the risks. So how has such public discourse affected the vaccination exercise? As far as we can tell, it has not. But uh, that part of the reason why I think it's important for me to also address some of the concerns tonight is related to the fact that uh, there's a need for us to balance the narrative as well. So maybe I could begin by talking a little bit about uh, our experience and then give the context. Within the Singapore setting, we've um, actually seen very rare occurrences of myocarditis. Um, about uh, two weeks ago, our Health Sciences Authority have actually published that we've seen about four in uh, the age group under 30 uh, years of age after giving almost 5 million doses. But I think we have to back up to see the real uh, context behind all of this. If you look at the US where they've given close to 400 million doses, they've seen just about 1,226 cases of myocarditis. Of course, myocarditis is commoner in the uh, young males from the teens to 30 years of age and can be due to very many causes. In the context of the US, however, it's important to bear in mind that um, with a fairly large number of infections that they've had, a significant number of them have actually been in children. In fact, more than 4 million children in the US have been infected with COVID, of which 17,000 have been hospitalized and they've had more than 300 deaths. At the same time, of course, they've had a handful of cases that have actually had myocarditis. So to put it in the right context, if they give um, 1 million second doses of COVID-19 vaccination, they have a very good chance of preventing 6,000 admissions, 6,000 cases, more than 200 admissions to hospital, 70 over ICU cases, and at least two deaths in that particular context. So it's important to actually know, uh, realize that the impact of vaccination in actually improving outcomes is very significant compared to the much smaller risk of a rare side effect that can occur. In that same sort of setting, it's estimated that they might see anything between 50 to 70 cases of myocarditis as well in that context per se. So I think that is actually the way in which we should be looking at the risk and when we look at the uh, vaccine adverse events reporting system in the US, that was part of a series of presentations that occurred. And the most important discussion followed after that, where they did a risk benefit evaluation. And the US CDC has agreed that the benefits far outweigh the risk of continuing with vaccination. This has also been involved and been endorsed Why? by the American Heart Association and the Academy of Pediatrics in the US. And Dr. Ong, so why are these dissenting views then? What are their concerns? And, and what is being done uh, or can be done to allay the concerns among the medical fraternity that, that seemingly disagree? I think one needs to bear in mind that uh, they are a very small minority. I think the majority of my colleagues probably would look at the information in a very different way from the small number that have actually uh, you know, raised this particular petition. And unfortunately, uh, if you don't look into the details of how they've actually presented the case, you might easily get misled. First, I think in the letter that we've written, we've mentioned that the three different references that they have, the first is actually not even resolved yet. And the second is, as I've actually pointed out, is only one of a series of presentations that the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices actually held in discussion at the CDC. More importantly, even the uh, correspondence that they listed was actually broadly supportive with one dissenting voice. So it's actually important for us to realize that uh, the impact of uh, 
of the uh, news that we're actually hearing is actually not significant per se. And uh, the vast majority of my colleagues do not view it the same way as this small number do. Dr Ong, you've mentioned there that the doctors may have, in fact, failed to give a full picture uh, in making their case about this in the mm -hmm. first place. Is there a sense that they were irresponsible in airing their concerns? But, and, and is there more that can be done against such actions? It's quite important for people like myself and my committee members as well to put out the proper context and actually give proper information so that the public can make the right decisions. Otherwise, if one reacts to every alarmist sort of uh, viewpoint that comes up, we will end up uh, not being able to actually proceed with what would be a very beneficial um, situation we have in Singapore, where we do have access to effective vaccines. If I were to put it in context uh, for all of us to also bear in mind, right now we are being impacted by the Delta variant of the coronavirus, of COVID-19. And we know very clearly that this Delta variant is much more infectious, is clearly involving younger individuals. And you can see that from our reports that have come out. And these young people that have been impacted in, involve both adolescents as well as children. Also within this particular age group, we have very limited active treatment options that we can apply. So I fear that uh, if we people don't actually see the right context and actually don't think carefully about the decision they ought to, ought to make, then we will have an outcome that we, we will find difficult right, to live with in the future. Also bear in mind that uh, without recourse to a, a vaccination per se, there will be a lot of disruptions to activities as it is right now. Uh, there are disruptions to school activities, there are school closures, CCA is significantly impacted. We've had to seriously adjust our examinations just to cope with this. And the best way in which we can get out of this is to proceed to get vaccinated if we are eligible. Now, Dr. Ong, coming back to the science of it all, cases of myocarditis and pericarditis have been rare, as you mentioned, and those who've had it so far were generally mild cases and recovered on their own or with minimal treatment. Could you help us understand better how high exactly is that risk and for what, which groups especially? The risk has been reported to largely be in males in uh, the adolescent age group to the age of 30. And even within our own uh, limited numbers that we've actually seen so far, uh, of the six cases that the Health Sciences Authority has reported, four of them are under the age of 30. The cases um, have generally been able to recover. And of course, uh, this is our own experience. We're just coming to 5 million doses. We continue, of course, to track what happens here as well as what happens overseas. Going by the experience overseas, overwhelmingly the cases have been mild and have recovered quite well. So I think that we should keep that in mind, even as we proceed. To actually also give the context, we've also uh, advised that following, particularly following the second dose, the individuals should actually take it easy for about seven days and not uh, exert themselves excessively as well. And they can look out for some of the complaints and symptoms that might occur uh, in any individuals if they should get myocarditis or pericarditis. Dr. Ong, thank you very much for your thoughts this evening. We've been speaking there with Dr. Benjamin Ong, Chair of the Expert Committee on COVID-19 Vaccination.